uh, uh, good morning. Uh, I think that uh, maybe some people uh, online are joining us uh, later in the day. Uh, following on from uh, uh, the uh, presentation uh, of uh, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Zhuzhana Litovska, uh, which was very much on positive goal. I think what I uh, would like to uh, uh, introduce is, uh, is a bit of an uh, uh, incursion uh, into uh, um, a more um, theoretical uh, question. But uh, as you will notice, it has a lot of, uh, I think, practical implications for everything we uh, come across in maritime law. Uh, and indeed, it's a bit of a... a uh, uh, controversial or weird question to ask ourselves whether there is a law for the poor and disenfranchised in maritime law. <laughs> I don't know how I came up with this, but it's something that has been uh, uh, really giving me a lot of uh, uh, cramps over the last few weeks. Uh, what therefore I suggest to to you is a bit of a test, so I'm 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 uh, I'm presenting something that is still in the uh, phase uh, of uh, the uh, uh, concept uh, uh, concept uh, proof really, and uh, but the paper, the actual paper, is uh, uh, coming out. Nicely, I would say. So there is going to be light at the end of the tunnel soon for me because this is going into a publication. Uh, so the uh, I think uh, I said enough about the purpose of this uh, uh, talk to you. Uh, the rationale I'm going to uh, elaborate a bit on why or what the foundations should be for questions like uh, uh, poverty in maritime law. Uh, and then we have to probably uh, ask ourselves, uh, what, what maritime law are we talking about? Uh, I know many of us uh, here have reference points, but as, uh, as we have also uh, neophytes and newcomers to maritime law, we, I think it would be good that uh, we establish an understanding of what, where maritime law lies and if there's a if there are injustices in maritime law, what are we talking about? What, what areas can be considered as problematic? Uh, in addition, uh, of course, I uh, strive to identify people that are really poor or disenfranchised or unprivileged. Uh, that we often, you know, uh, come uh, uh, like uh, 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 gloss over or um, simply just. Uh, uh, mentioned without really wondering much about their standing, in fact, in terms of uh, uh, social justice. So I've, 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 I have identified a few. Maybe some of them will be surprising to you. There may be others as well that uh, deserve attention. Um, uh, well, and of course, uh, 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 it will be relevant to discuss what maritime law principles or rules may be considered to be problematic for these people to, and that they're suffering from. <clears throat> um, and they uh, have a word about the benchmarks, the standards by which we judge whether um, a poverty exists or not, or um, disenfranchisement uh, lies. Uh, who said that? I mean, we're lawyers at, at the end of the day. So is it is it the international law? Is it the constitutions of our countries? Is it, or is it, are, are there norms of uh, ethics? Uh, so those are the aspects of uh, perhaps that uh, uh, that bit of the discussion. So I start off with uh, maybe just a quote from uh, 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 legal scholars that have uh, emphasized that. Law is fundamentally a recreation or reinstitutionalization of social relations in a narrower, relatively discrete, and professionally managed context. Because we have to bear this in mind, uh, 
Uh, not everything in, merit, in the maritime space operates accordance to, in accordance with the law, the rule of the, of the law. Um, uh, the, the, the law is only one um, one aspect, really, of the governance of uh, maritime space. Uh, there's there's a lot of uh, even in the best legal societies, there's a lot that is. Uh, in fact, uh, 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 governed by non-legal norms, such as um, uh, 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 behavioral uh, codes. Uh, and uh, there's also the issue of uh, um, societies where uh, the rules of law that we know of in the West perhaps, are uh, simply uh, not, uh, not followed. Like, uh, these countries have constitutions that uh, uh, underscore the rule of law, but in fact, in many aspects of maritime affairs, they don't have laws uh, that govern uh, things like uh, safety, or, or all the international conventions, for example, about safety, security, labor, that we consider are, are fundamental and that uh, um, Ma Maria went uh, uh, to a large extent to, uh, to, to present in the Croatian sy system of law. Well, in many countries, they don't even have the basic laws to incorporate the international maritime conventions. Yet in those countries, they actually apply the the the, uh, the international conventions without the rule of law and because the treaties may not actually have been incorporated into the legal systems of these countries so we have uh, we have uh, i think we have to bear that in mind that law is just one one tool and uh, the to continue with this quote um uh, I think I'll just uh, emphasize the last sentence. Uh, to know the uses of law, we need to know not only how and by whom the law is used, but also when and by whom it is not used. Uh, so it's about experiences in the law, of course, and that uh, brings up empirical research in terms of uh, uh, this subject and others. So, uh, just as, a, uh, as an additional uh, group on the uh, justification for why we should consider something like uh, uh, the justice of uh, maritime law, how, 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 how well is it serving justice? I think we could uh, reflect on sustainable development goals that uh, have been... The first goal is no poverty. Uh, but when you look at the target factors or the targets under uh, that uh, goal number one, uh, it doesn't really spell out uh, issues with law. Law could be, in fact, uh, leading to poverty uh, or leading to injustice. Um, uh, so I know it's like uh, these sustainable development goals are very uh, wide ranging and uh, very uh, loose uh, slogans, uh, but um, they seem to also uh, somehow work well for many of the scholars who, who refer to them constantly. I mean, you have that also in maritime law. There's a, a bit of, a, of a contamination, I would say, of uh, sustainable development goals into many of the discourses. Uh, and the other one is another sustainable development goal is uh, 16, which talks about uh, justice and strong institutions. So the word justice uh, featured there as, uh, and I think the, the, the targets for that uh, goal 16 can, uh, are a bit more relevant to, uh, uh, to, to the topic that I am presenting to you because they talk about uh, ensuring that everyone has access to justice. So whatever that means, of course. So um, those, that sort of served as my um, uh, rationale for the uh, bringing this topic into this uh, session. Uh, I'd like to now move on to uh, unraveling basically the question of what maritime law is.
is there one that I mean, if, if we want to uh, uh, talk about uh, injustices in maritime law, uh, what maritime law is that? I think that uh, uh, this is something that we can all uh, 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 we can all ask ourselves: Is there one maritime law? I think it's an open-ended question, but to try to simplify it, uh, we can we can juxtapose the national versus the international uh, components of maritime law. Uh, to to begin uh, with, uh, maritime law uh, in terms of uh, national views can be seen as a chunk or a section of all the laws. So when we have, uh, we, we know that ships, we know that operations at sea uh, include uh, administrative law, include public law, uh, contracts, uh, commercial law, criminal law. So I think we, uh, we will not disagree that there is all of that uh, applying at sea. Uh, so that's the first bullet. I think that uh, we also uh, note, or we can agree that uh, uh, maritime law, is, the rules that apply at sea can vary from those applying at land. But sometimes the same rules applying at land will apply at sea. So that's why um, uh, we, we say that, in fact, it's a section of all the laws uh, uh, there, there may be special, special rules of maritime uh, law uh, juxtaposed to the, the normal rules or the general rules. We can also, uh, as uh, stated in the second bullet, uh, agree that maritime law does vary from one country to another. Uh, uh, and that's... Uh, that's absolutely a uh, uh, sorry. Uh, as uh, absolutely a, uh, I think we will not disagree with that. Uh, so we have different national maritime laws. Uh, so the national law of the national maritime law of Croatia differs from that of other countries. So if we go back to the topic, uh, is it uh, is it just uh, is it a just maritime law that can has to be by reference to a specific national maritime law, because maritime law does, does vary from one country to another. Uh, and uh, lastly, uh, as with the last bullet, I think we, uh, we should, um, uh, we, we should uh, uh, agree that, uh, uh, that well, we, I think I, su I suggest that, uh, submit to you that, the uh, the same rules may vary from one sector in maritime law to another. So de dealing with, for, for example, the issues of uh, pollution uh, in in uh, coastal waters, uh, depending on the substance that is uh, uh, the pollutant, the the rules will vary from in terms of civil liability, for example. So if it's oil. The uh, financial limitation, uh, the financial compensation will be different from uh, hazardous and noxious substances or nuclear uh, nuclear pollution, uh, which is quite uh, quite uh, 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 astonishing when you think about it. Uh, from one sector in maritime law to another, there will be different rules. But that is the reality also. So there are actually, even in national law, I think, very many different uh, maritime laws. Uh, and uh, from the international perspective, I think we, uh, we, we, we know this. We are, there's a lot of international law uh, that has uh, uh, driven, uh, driven the, the formation, actually, of rules in each state uh, of its own maritime law. That's why we have international treaties that have come, tried to bring uniformity across uh, jurisdictions. And uh, again, uh, as, as I mentioned it earlier, uh, uh, with that example of uh, pollution, liability, and compensation, there are different treaties on liability and compensation adopting different rules uh, for instance, in terms of standards of liability 
or uh, liability compensation and caps. Uh, so uh, I think uh, this drives me to say that there is no single maritime law. There are many maritime laws. Uh, so it's probably a bit controversial, but uh, that's my conclusion, I think, on, on that aspect. And moving on to uh, uh, whom I see as uh, possible uh, uh, as, as these uh, uh, people that may uh, deserve our attention. Um, so I've identified three groups of under-resourced or disadvantaged, uh, one could say poor uh, in inverted commas, litigants. So first to start with, Shippers, uh, obviously, this is a, uh, this is an area where we're dealing with cargo claims. Uh, so cargo claims, basically, uh, people that uh, resort to uh, uh, having their sh goods transported by professional carriers. Uh, we often uh, think about this as, uh, uh, I mean, that, that is the mainstay of maritime law. Maritime law begins really and ends, I think, with the carriage, carriage of goods, because uh, we, 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 we can consider that uh, uh, maritime law uh, developed really out of the business of transporting goods, I think, historically. Uh, so a lot of the rules, uh, the other rules, somehow gravitate around mm -hmm. cargo law. Uh, so it's an important aspect, even though other areas are just as important today. 80% uh, of world trade still travels by sea, but we uh, often uh, dis, uh, or neglect some of the smaller shippers. And I, I have identified the non in, in the title of the slide, as you can see, the non-professional sh shippers to start with. Who are these? Well, uh, as you can see uh, from my fourth bullet, uh, there's uh, there are shippers that that that, uh, uh, that that export or import goods on a professional basis because they are uh, they are doing that uh, routinely. So they will, uh, for the purpose of their businesses, uh, often resort to those services provided by carriers, professional carriers. So the big, um, uh, for, for, for example, I mean, the oil companies, they, they are professional shippers because they, are, uh, they have departments fully constituted for the purpose of negotiating uh, um, this kind of uh, service that is accessory to their business of producing uh, and, and selling uh, oil. Um, and this is, a, 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 I think, uh, as opposed to smaller, uh, smaller or non-professional uh, uh, shippers that, uh, uh, for, for example, a, a person that is uh, moving house or moving moving house from one country to another, uh, they will, have, they they may need the services of an ocean carrier, uh, either uh, either. Uh, a vessel owner or a non-vessel uh, owner carrier and and boc um, uh, and and uh, these non-professional shippers and consignees in a way uh, they're not really uh, talked about much in the literature we notice that there's uh, uh, a lot usually a consistent silence about them. They have uh, a standing, of course, because they can uh, be parties to the same contracts of carriage as the bigger companies, uh, but uh, they are not really uh, the focus of much of the uh, literature. Um, in UNTAD's actually review of maritime transport, uh, they distinguish between small shippers and, and the, what they don't really call the larger shippers, because UNTAD, as the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development, is often is always looking at the vulnerable uh, uh, interests of developing countries. So they take into consideration that in uh, uh, many of the developing world, there are uh, shippers of a smaller size with not the same uh, uh, 
level of uh, professional uh, uh, preparation than uh, in, in other countries. Uh, also, uh, the untrue chippers, as you can see from the title of the slides, yes, uh, there are chippers that, uh, contrary to uh, wisdom, uh, general wisdom, will uh, uh, entrust their goods to ocean freighters without seeking marine insurance. It may be a crime to do that. We know that, uh, that it's really totally against uh, best practices, but uh, the uh, the uh, disaster of the ever given in the in Suez Canal brought out, uh, brought to light that there actually were was uh, the the were cargo interests that had not insured uh, commodities across the sea journey. So uh, these uh, these people, these claimants, have uh, a bit of a weaker standard. Let's face it, uh, uh, compared with the professional shippers compared with the insured shippers, because if you have insurance, obviously, your insurer will uh, be subrogated, so they will process your claim on behalf of you, uh, and insurance companies have uh, fully fledged uh, claims handling departments that can do that, but if you are a loan shipper, uh, you know, not, uh, not in these categories of the uh, professional shippers, then you may have uh, a lot of challenges to approach any of this when it comes to uh, uh, enforcing your rights. We know that uh, in terms of the uh, penultimate uh, bullet on uh, this uh, slide, the cargo law, marine cargo law, uh, developed historically to satisfy mostly, I think, the, the, the rights of the cargo claimant. The Hague Risky Rules in 1924 were adopted because there was uh, historic injustice towards cargo claimants uh, because of all the exceptions to the exceptions clauses in uh, bills of lading that over the 19th century and into the early part of the 20th century, carriers were uh, uh, placing in the bills of lading to ex exonerate them almost completely all liability for the cargo. So the hate industry rules came in to uh, uh, rein in a bit on these uh, liberty clauses by having minimum liability for the carrier. So uh, we know also that uh, the hate industry rules led to the Hamburg rules and then onto the Rotterdam rules. Uh, we now have a system which is uh, quite chaotic in international conventions. Uh, and I'm not sure that ultimately in the Rotterdam Rules uh, uh, episode, the, the, the rights of the uh, cargo claimants were upheld in the same way uh, as they had been in uh, the earlier uh, conventions. I mean, that's an open question. Um, so uh, I think the uh, I, I will end it there with this uh, aspect of these uh, litigants uh, and move on to seafarers. Uh, we had very, uh, very I think very crystal clear presentations earlier this morning about uh, the fate of the seafarers. They're essential, of course, to the operation of the ship, but they are uh, notoriously a weak party. Uh, and uh, Maria, you said, you, I think you, you didn't say that perhaps uh, uh, as clearly as I'm saying it, but you said there's, they have to be, they have, there's, a special, there's a special group. I think we, what, what we often uh, don't say is that they're a weak party perhaps or in, in, in many, many cases. Maybe Laura was a bit more uh, uh, open about it. Uh, but we, I think we all agree on that. The fact that they're a weak party and it is really due to systematic maritime law. I mean, I think the culprit is, of course, maritime law. Maritime law is not really friendly to the seafarers. That's my uh, 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 not so honest opinion. <laughs> okay, whatever. <laughs> uh, I think Laura was uh, saying that also in uh, her own words. Uh, the concept of the exclusive flag, flag state jurisdiction. I think you saw that also from, from Laura's uh, uh, presentation. It actually leads to uh, injustices because uh, uh, the seafarers are uh, in the hands really of uh, 
the ship owner's law of the flag, uh, regardless of the law of residence. Uh, so there's this dissociation from the re normal reference points of the seafarers. Uh, if they're on board the ship, they automatically fall under the law of the flag state. Um, and that law of the flag, you know, we, we, that can be anything from uh, flags, uh, an open register to a flag of convenience. So in other words, it may not be the best uh, labor uh, law friendly uh, uh, system. Uh, special maritime law, uh, maritime labor law. Uh, yeah, uh, as, as Maria said also, labor law at sea differs from labor law at land. So the seafarers have a different regime of labor that applies to them. And it had historically it's been like that. And, and that could, in a way, in itself, it has, uh, I think it, uh, it has the, the germs of injustice uh, because they are not treated the same as people on land or they workers on land. And we, we accept that. I mean, we have, uh, we have maritime labor convention which has a completely different system of labor law for seafarers um, uh, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, so I, I, that's why I say that systemically maritime law has elements of uh, uh, making that uh, party, the seafarer, vulnerable. Uh, if seafarers decide to go after uh, uh, their employers, they have to uh, um, uh, you know, first of all, they have to be uh, careful whom they're signing their contracts with because uh, there's a lot of employers that have uh, a few assets around, and there may be in other jurisdictions that are that where there's they have difficulty of access. So, also, the last point is that the Maritime Labor Convention of the ILO is simply a minimum standard, I think, uh, even though it's a high standard. Well, that's also subject to. It's controversial because in, in the part of the world where I come from, uh, I mean Scandinavia, where I'm based, so I got these people from Denmark the, a few weeks ago to talk to the students, from, largely from developing countries, about the MLC implementation. And uh, they come from shipping companies, the, the speakers, those speakers. They said, yeah, but in Denmark, uh, I mean, I'm talking about MERS, uh, even though I shouldn't name companies, uh, and another one. Uh, MLC in, in those Scandinavian countries is uh, they go well in above it. So in, in my students were kind of uh, astonished because they're, they're striving to uh, implement uh, just the MLC. Uh, so it's a minimum standard. Uh, um, it, 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 uh, so it can definitely be improved upon. And uh, the per MLC does not also set out everything. There's a lot of room for, uh, for uh, a lot of things have to be added by the legislation and or the company policies, the collective agreements. Uh, we know that uh, the uh, in, in terms of insurance, P and I clubs, the liability uh, of course the P and I clubs serve the interests of the ship owners, the employers. They're not there to. Uh, I mean, they, they 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 cover the liability of the ship owner or their employer towards the seafarers, but uh, I, I don't see uh, the uh, uh, um, uh, a same kind of structure for uh, to help out the uh, seafarers from their perspective necessarily. Because after all, we and I clubs are the owner, ship that Yes, they, these are clubs of ship owners. So I know it's, all of this is controversial to you guys, and, uh, and, uh, and I, I'm open to criticism on this. Access to justice, uh, so seafarers, there's definitely a, an issue of access and justice. My last uh, category, I don't think you would be surprised by this uh, either. It, this is a capture. So the last, uh, I think, category of identified priv uh, unprivileged or uh, really uh, people that are suffering in maritime law, I think it's the sea migrants. Whether we call them sea migrants or refugees or asylum seekers, you know, there's a big uh, controversy about the legal terms. This is taken from the UN Refugee Agency on the Mediterranean specifically, bearing in mind that there are other sea crossings uh, of uh, both people in other parts of the world. Like now in uh, the Rohingya, I think there's a bit of a, again, a renewed spate of crossings between uh, uh, Myanmar and Bangladesh. 
but uh, just the figures of this year, um, already, if you look at the red figure, already a thousand, over a thousand deaths in the Mediterranean for just people that have attempted to cross the Mediterranean. Um, these figures a couple of years uh, back were multiplied by five, six, seven, eight. I mean, we have, we reach even uh, over 5,000 deaths in one year uh, 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 at the height of the Syrian crisis, the Syrian refugee crisis, for example. Uh, so a thousand deaths in the Mediterranean year see uh, for this year. Uh, you can see also the figures. I mean, almost a hundred thousand uh, arrivals by sea. Um, uh, that's that's the backdrop to the to a maritime law from that perspective. So sea migrants uh, is really a shame. I think of maritime transport. You know, I um, I, I work in WMU, which is under the umbrella of uh, IMO, but I can openly say that all the rules of ship safety, maritime safety. They are not working to uh, the to help on this issue. It's like there seems to be complete uh, silence or uh, ineffectual uh, protection for these people. Uh, we have a lot of uh, standards uh, regarding ship safety, but uh, somehow they 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 are uh, they are missed when it talk when we, we when we're dealing with this issue. As I mentioned, the definitional, definitional challenge with sea migrants. Um, uh, so, so I think we have definitely a problem there. Um, um, and uh, perhaps, uh, so I think when, uh, when, I want, when moving on to uh, try to conclude this session uh, or this presentation, um, we, I mean, there are there's there's enough. I think uh, uh, law for us to uh, uh, assess uh, injustices or uh, difficulties with access to justice for all of these claimants and maybe others. But uh, the the challenge is to look for a reference point, and I'm not sure that we have a reference point today to raise. Uh, question like this in maritime law. Uh, I think that the, the maritime law community, as it is constituted, sort of turns a blind eye to all of this somehow. Uh, and I know I'm being provocative like that, because we're constituted in ways that uh, uh, don't address necessarily the issues from that angle. We uh, 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 often we are we, we learn maritime law as if uh, it is a law that serves the interest the operation of the ship so everything that helps the ship uh, not necessarily the people that uh, come in or around the ship uh, so after all it's a lip it's it's quite a capitalistic branch of law uh, that uh, we has gone into our brains and I, I mean I'm, I'm also uh, probably uh, just as you uh, are influenced by how we are, we have been taught this uh, branch of the law. Uh, so the, the reference points, of course, there are many. Uh, I think uh, 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 at least we can agree that maritime law today is subject to the legal controls, to the con uh, constitutional uh, standards that apply in other branches. So there's no exception. There shouldn't be an exception to maritime law just because it's difficult and there are perils in the sea uh, that they should actually have, uh, get away with uh, uh, their own their own uh, rules of justice, sort of their own standards of justice. I think that has uh, we have moved away slowly with that, even though there are still remnants. And I think uh, we we still see a lot of justification for the perils of the sea. The special nature of maritime law as a, 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 a as the dangerous environment, uh, but I think in terms of law that uh, 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 that is increasingly uh, 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 waning, and we have a sizable body of case law that has addressed the specific challenges to in maritime law uh, corners from different parts of the world uh, in terms of just justice constitutionality. Human rights. Uh, one could mention the the pirates, uh, the, the recent uh, spate of piracy, where pirates in U.S. courts 
uh, challenge a lot of the old piracy laws. I'm, I'm okay. <laughs> In conclusion, <laughs> thank you. Uh, so, just a few pointers. Is this, uh, I, 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 as I said, this is a, like an uh, open for debate. Is this a pertinent topic? Is it timely? Uh, I kind of answered that already. Uh, we uh, think, remember also the words of uh, David Attar, law used to be used as a sword uh, or a shield. The, that's the conundrum. Uh, uh, there are issues of access to justice, human rights, fundamental human rights here, decent work uh, of seafarers, uh, consumer protection, because all, all these people can also be uh, uh, consumers. So the consumer protection law comes in. Uh, corporate social responsibility, which is a big theme today. Um, and what more can be said about the topics? I think we can also mention the environmental claimants, people that suffer from coastal developments. That's also an area where uh, there are unprivileged uh, people stand, uh, with standing in maritime laws. They, 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 they see a big hotel or a big golf course uh, mm -hmm. developed next to the pristine uh, coast. Uh, the indigenous people, the, uh, also, which is a, uh, I think it's still kind of, uh, it's called, called for more development, people under occupation. Uh, okay, I think I can. Thank you so much. <laughs>